Welcome to my Multiple Careers podcast. This is the sixth episode in the series Ikigai and Multiple Careers, where I'll talk about the third strategy to achieve flow and discover your Ikigai. The goal of my Multiple Careers YouTube channel and podcast is to help people build fulfilling and meaningful careers and have a life with less regret instead of just living a life on autopilot, going through the motions and doing what everyone else does. I believe that to live our lives to the fullest, we need something that drives us to move forward and grow. But we also need something that frightens us, something we run away from or want to avoid. That something that drives us is our purpose. And a closely related concept is the Japanese concept of Ikigai, the thing that drives us to action, what makes life worth living, a kind of existential fuel. On the other hand, everyone has things that they are afraid of. And when I think through it, I believe that the ultimate fear that is useful is the fear of regret. My hopes are that these podcasts and YouTube videos I make can help you to dare to go after a fulfilling and meaningful career with less regret. Today, I'll continue to talk about discovering your Ikigai, how achieving flow is one way that you'll get closer to it, and another strategy that you can apply to achieve flow. There are three strategies that can help you achieve flow and get you closer to discovering your Ikigai. These are loosely based on the book Ikigai, The Japanese Secret to a Long and Happy Life by Hector Garcia and Frances Mirales. In case you're new to this podcast, this is not a book review of Ikigai, but here I want to zoom in on those parts that are closely related to building a fulfilling and meaningful career. In the last two episodes, I talked about strategy number one, which is choose tasks that are difficult but not too difficult, and number two, have a clear and concrete objective. The third strategy three I'll focus on today is to concentrate on a single task. I'll talk about how this relates to flow, finding your ikigai, and what this means for how you can approach your job and career, and also how to choose your job in the first place. The opposite of concentrating on a single task is multitasking, something that I must say I do very often, that creates stress that I try to avoid but oftentimes fail to do. And I am positive that I'm not alone here. Rather, most or the majority of us multitask. We multitask on a larger scale where we switch from one thing to another every 10 minutes. For example, starting to write, then make breakfast, then work for 10 minutes again, then watch the news, and so on. As well as on a micro level, meaning we work but in between constantly look at our phones, chat with a friend, scan through a document, read some email, work on an Excel sheet, read a piece of news, and so on. Let me know in the comments what your multitasking sequences look like. We feel extremely busy, and some people even feel productive, although they're not. In fact, there are studies that show that working on several things at once lowers our productivity by at least 60% and our IQ by more than 10 points. And here I want to differentiate between highly connected tasks and unconnected tasks. Switching between highly connected tasks would look like this. You are preparing a post for your Instagram, let's say. Here you rapidly switch between looking what your last post was, searching for a good picture, looking for a suitable typography, crafting a message, and then editing your picture. These are strictly speaking different tasks, but they are all aligned towards one goal. On the other hand, there are highly unconnected tasks. This would be, for example, working on a PowerPoint presentation for work while simultaneously trying to plan what to cook for dinner. These are totally disconnected tasks. And well, there is nothing simultaneous about it. Many people are under the illusion that by multitasking, they are more productive. They save time because they are doing many things at once. While in reality, all that they are doing is switching back and forth. If you need one hour to finish your presentation and you need 10 minutes to plan what to cook for dinner, how does typing out the latest sales strategy interspersed with browsing what ingredients you need to buy to make goulash will speed things up in any way? Every time you switch tasks, you expend energy which is lost on nothing. 
Our generation is suffering from an epidemic of multitasking, based on a study conducted at Stanford University by Clifford Ivarnas. Do we multitask because we seriously think we get more done? Or is multitasking just an addiction that we can't shake off? Here's a great summary by the authors in their book Ikigai, The Japanese Secret to a Long and Fulfilling Life. Here they contrast concentrating on a single task and multitasking. Concentrating on a single task makes achieving flow more likely, while multitasking makes achieving flow impossible. Concentrating on a single task increases productivity, increases our power of retention, and makes us less likely to make mistakes. While multitasking decreases productivity by 60%, makes it harder to remember things, and makes us more likely to make mistakes. And even worse, multitasking makes us feel stressed by the sensation that we're losing control, that our tasks are controlling us, while concentrating on a single task will help us to feel calm and in control of the task at hand. While concentrating on a single task causes us to become more considerate as we pay full attention to those around us. Multitasking causes us to hurt those around us through our addiction to stimuli, always checking our phones, always on social media, and in the end, we ignore the people close to us. If we concentrate on one single thing, that will increase our creativity, while multitasking reduces creativity. So if you've experienced these symptoms of multitasking, then you'll realize how bad it is for you. Multitasking makes it impossible to achieve flow. Your flow is constantly cut short by some form of distraction. Here's how I believe that ikigai and flow are interconnected. If the activities you do, your work, is aligned with your ikigai, it will be more easy to achieve flow. On the other hand, trying to achieve flow may help you discover your ikigai. This means that multitasking is, in a way, a major obstacle to discover your ikigai. You'll always be doing things on a surface level rather than digging deeper into something. Now, how does this relate to job and career? If you are in a job right now where you multitask all the time and want to reduce it, here are two basic ways to go, or rather two options you have, which I also talked about in previous episodes. The first one is that you stay in your current job or career and optimize it, meaning that given the rules in your job, your tasks, your environment, you try your best to concentrate on one thing and avoid multitasking. First, you need to identify why you multitask, whether it's due to an external factor or internal factor, or perhaps even both. This is what it means if you multitask because of external factors. It means that in this job, you have to multitask in order to carry out your job. It's the nature of the job in a way. The rules of the job require it, and your boss actually expects you to multitask. This is oftentimes the case for people working as receptionists. There are many other jobs, of course, where you have to multitask, but this is the most straightforward example everyone will understand. If you work at a dental office, you have to respond to multiple things within a short time things that are often unrelated but deemed as urgent. For example, you're working on preparing an invoice for a patient who is waiting in front of you. Then the dental assistant approaches you because she needs a quote for another patient in the waiting room immediately. And then a new patient comes in the door who you need to greet and assist almost immediately. The phone has been continuously ringing for the last 15 minutes and at some point you just have to pick it up. You can't insist on finishing your invoice for just 10 minutes before you address the other things. What about multitasking due to internal factors? This means that there is no absolute necessity for you to immediately respond to something, but you just feel the need to respond immediately and switch tasks right there and then. This is often the case for management jobs. I experienced this a lot during my time in project management. I'm working on a presentation for some kickoff meeting and then I see an email in my inbox from the management team of the headquarters in the UK. And it seems to be something very important. It might not be that urgent though, but still, I can't resist to just click on it and read through it. 
it completely takes me out of my presentation mode. Just seconds ago, I was thinking about kicking off a project to relaunch internet banking, and now I'm reading this new initiative about customer experience. Many new layers of information and data is loaded onto my brain, which is already running on full capacity and high speed. Then, because it's an open office, a colleague from marketing drops by and asks me to send her the presentation deck from last week. My concentration is spread across three things or more. That was me back then. I'm happy it's not the case anymore. One reason is that I've changed the way that I work and the other reason is that I'm no longer working in that particular job and career. This is an example of a combination where the environment demands you to multitask, which is external, but also where you acquire the habit of succumbing to multitasking, which is internal. This could be because you want to please people or out of pure habit. Some people even like to multitask because it makes them feel super busy and strangely important. So it's crucial to be aware of the case where it's you creating the pressure to multitask. You have to have the honesty to admit to yourself whether it's 100% your job forcing you to multitask or if it's just an excuse and you are the driving force behind it. Let's assume that there are cases where it's you. You are the one making yourself multitask. Acknowledging this is the first step. Then you can strategically reduce this by setting up rules of work for yourself. In today's world of work, this is especially relevant to how you approach communication. How do you respond to people's messages? In the form of people approaching you directly, calling you on the phone, emailing you, messaging you on Skype, WhatsApp, internal chat, and whatever. And the other thing is how you choose to access and absorb information such as news, browsing, YouTube, and others. Some people think that they have to check their messages all the time, when in fact, we do not have to. There are exceptions in certain jobs, of course. If you're a surgeon, then you have to make sure you check your phone in case you need to attend to a patient who has a heart attack. But then there are a lot of other jobs and careers, I would say the majority here, where it doesn't hurt to leave a message unread for a certain time. It's very different in every job and career, and you need to identify what this threshold is. If you've been in a job for some time, you will be able to establish how long you can leave a message unchecked that is acceptable to other people and that will not create a bottleneck. Meaning, if other people rely on you to finish a task before they can continue, then you might need to check that message after all. That is an immediate solution, a quick fix. The other, better way to do it is that you proactively approach tasks. Finish tasks during a time of your choosing so you can avoid that bottleneck and at the same time you'll not be caught off guard by other people asking you to complete that task. So once you've identified that time, let's say one hour, then try to stick to that rule. Turn off the notification sounds of your chats and emails. Choose the time when you will check in to see if there is a message. This means then that during that one hour, you can fully concentrate on something else. If one hour is impossible, set it to 30 minutes. There is a lot you can get done within 30 minutes of concentrated work. After those 30 minutes, take a break and look at your phone, your message, your email. For email, I allow even more time. If people send you an email, in most cases, they realize that it's a slower mode of communication compared to a phone call. It means that they'll be prepared that you might not read the email within the next hours, but perhaps within the next one to two days. And if it's really urgent, they'll find another way to contact you. Again, there are exceptions depending on the sort of informal contract that exists in your organization. I check my emails one to two times a day, and I try to keep it to one time. Usually, I check my work-related email around noon or after lunch. This means that I catch any email that was sent that morning. If someone then sends me an email at 4 p.m., then they will be prepared for the possibility that I'll respond the next day. My personal email I check in the evenings after the end of my workday. There has never been anything urgent that can be attended to within one day. If my family or my friends have anything more urgent, they will text me, message, or call me. If it's really critical, then they'll call me, and my ringer is always on. 
Delaying my response doesn't mean that I care less or pay less attention. It's completely the opposite. By choosing the time when I respond, I am more focused. I prepare time specifically to respond to that person's need. That is why I only check messages when I know that I'll have focused time to respond. The quality of my response is always better compared to when I just quickly reply to a message in between doing another important task. There are many more ways how you can strategize responding, so you'll create more time to concentrate and more opportunities to achieve flow. Maybe I'll talk about that in another video. Now let's talk about accessing information. Here, you are the one who initiates the action. You Google something, you search for a YouTube video, listen to the news, etc. There are so many things that can tempt us to put our work aside and let ourselves get distracted. It happened to me a lot when I was first writing content for my YouTube videos. I would start writing an outline or a blog post. Then I needed a piece of information, which I would Google, which then led me down a rabbit hole. Yes, it was interesting and insightful, but it would pull me out of my flow. People do this while studying as well. Do you remember studying for your exams? Then not being able to concentrate, you turn on the TV or YouTube and watch a video, which then becomes two videos, three videos, and so on. If you have a strategy or a plan in place, you can avoid that. This is what I do now. I don't ban YouTube or TV or Google, but rather I decide when I'll access it. I only watch Netflix at night, even on weekends. Watching series, films is something I really love to do and I let myself enjoy it. But it's almost the last thing of the day that I'll do. I also still watch tons of YouTube, but during the day I limit YouTube to educational content. Videos on how to grow my YouTube channel, about topics related to what I'm doing. And even that I limit to a certain number of videos or time. After that, I just transition into listening music specifically instrumental jazz music or classical music. It gets me into a working mode. When I'm writing and I need a piece of information, I decide what I'm looking for first before I enter search in Google. That way I stay focused. It doesn't mean that I don't let my mind wander. I do it a lot, in fact, but there's a different time for that. Every morning, I try to read for at least 15 to 30 minutes. And during that time, it's free association, meaning that I let my mind wander, look up different things. I'm in a less focused but more brainstorming mode. And that is where I get my ideas from. If applied to a job at a big corporation, for example, it means that you don't indiscriminately consume all the content given to you. You pick your time for when you'll read something or study something or when you'll start tackling a task. So rather than reacting immediately by starting something the moment it hits your desk, you can put it aside and plan time for it. Except of course, if your boss insists that you start right now. But in many cases, you can ask for or negotiate a timeline and plan when you want to do it. But if that's not the case, if you have almost zero control about how you approach work when you do things, when you respond, and if that bothers you, distracts you, and makes you feel like you can't concentrate, then perhaps it's time to leave the job or the career for something else. This leads me to the second option, which is change to a job or career where you'll be able to concentrate more easily and experience flow more frequently. There are things that you can do to increase flow within a job or career but you have to realize the limitations. There are specific jobs or careers where this is simply not possible. Ask yourself how important it is to you to experience flow, what it means in terms of having a fulfilling and meaningful career, but also for your stress levels and health and consider whether it's worth changing jobs or even careers. There is a personality factor too. There are people who experience multitasking itself as a state of flow. I once worked in a cafe where I had to multitask between working at the cashier, handling the oven, pouring drinks into cups, and preparing cappuccinos, a typical multitasking situation. I must say that I experienced phases of flow here, but mostly because the cognitive level required was low. It was physically challenging, but it was easy to just switch between tasks every 10 seconds or so. But it's very different for a lot of management jobs. 
If you are working on over 10 projects a day, it becomes very hard if you're working on one project, for example, in relation to analytics and start it for half an hour, only to get interrupted midway and have to switch your mindset to customer service. And then after a few minutes, get interrupted by a phone call. If you feel that this kind of environment or framework is seriously bothering you, then it's time to review. Try to find a job or career which is closer to your ikigai. It might not make you more money, but it will make you more aligned with yourself. In case you feel like you're experiencing a crisis because of too much multitasking, take it as an opportunity to search for your ikigai. Give yourself the chance to explore and try out activities where you are aligned with your ikigai. See where that takes you. It might lead to a hobby, but over the long term, it might just lead to a new job and even new career. One of my main ikigai is acting. When I'm acting, I feel like I'm in a different universe. I feel that time goes by so fast. Because I'm enjoying every moment, I'm absorbed like a little kid playing their favorite game. Did it make me money? Or do I have an established career in acting? Not at all. Or at least not yet. But regardless of that, my life is more fulfilled and meaningful because at least I am pursuing acting and once in a while I do get the opportunity to act in something. I've left my job and career in banking and with it the monetary rewards. But still I am happier because I am doing less of the things that I dislike. Whenever I reach a state of flow, there is something in me that feels very tranquil, happy and I just feel in tune with myself. Perhaps that is what Ikigai feels like, if you can put it that way. Ikigai will be a topic that I'll continue to talk about in future, because Ikigai and multiple careers are highly connected. To live by your Ikigai, it sometimes requires to have multiple careers. You might have more than one Ikigai, and the concept of multiple careers allows you to pursue different careers at different stages of your life, instead of just sticking to a standard career. On the other hand, exploring multiple careers means that you are already on a search to get to the specific kind of career that is most aligned with your Ikigai. This was the last episode of my podcast series, Ikigai and Multiple Careers, and I hope you enjoyed it. Let me know in the comments what your thoughts are. Do you prefer sticking to a job that is not optimal for achieving flow? and try to maximize flow as much as you can within it? Or would you prefer moving to a job or different career in which flow can happen more naturally? If you don't want to miss out on the next videos and other content related to building a fulfilling and meaningful career, don't forget to subscribe and hit the little alarm bell if you're listening to this on YouTube. Thank you so much for listening and I'll talk to you again soon.